So I'm going to um, just give you guys another uh, brief overview of InfoSight itself. I know some of you uh, may have heard a bit of this um, in the past, but for those of <coughs> you who have not heard it, um, hopefully this will be new to you and uh, a little bit informative. So I think um, you know, maybe even when you guys had actually driven over here today or have been around your, um, your various sites this week, you may have, when you got into the, to the van, somebody typed in the next address into the navigation system on that, uh, that car. And before you even shift it into drive, you actually expect that the navigation system is telling you which way to go. And when that doesn't happen and it's slow, people get very frustrated. And oftentimes you might see this little spinny thing. And it's that that we call the app data gap. When data is just not being delivered to you, either in a timely manner or even at all. So not unlike our frustration when that happens to us, you can imagine that the impact to businesses is even worse and more critical. So they're running critical business processes. And when they experience that app data gap, that's business impacting to them. And it's very crucial that we close that app data gap and remove that slow delivery of data. <coughs> so we looked at uh, 7,500 customers, and we looked at all of the cases that we've dealt with over a you know, several month period of time to really study where that gap is coming from. And it turns out that it's related to things like storage, networking, host side issues, virtual machine issues, um, configuration issues are pretty common. Uh, sometimes there's interoperability issues between applications and other things in the network or maybe the operating systems and so on or storage. So it's a whole plethora of things that ultimately cause that app data gap and that potential slowdown or even again non-delivery of data that's impacting your business. So we actually, when we look at it in detail, it turns out that less than half is storage related. And you guys may be familiar. Um, I know we are. I know a lot of us in the room have storage backgrounds. We are always the first ones to get blamed, typically by the application side or the IT guy who is stuck trying to figure it out for that application or that database admin. It's the storage realm that they go to first, assuming that's where the issue is. And it's very clear from the study we did that, of course, it's, you know, it's, there's 46% you know, is storage, but it's not everything. You know, the majority is actually something else going, in in that, going on in that environment. So what we learned here is that it's critical to not just monitor what's going on in storage. You have to look at the entire stack of information, all the way up to the virtual machines and even eventually up to the apps and, and so on, to really understand where the issues are coming from. And as you know, Gavin presented to you our all flash array, that takes care of part of the problem. When you have a storage system that is performing at sub-millisecond uh, consistency, consistently delivering that sub-millisecond latency. But as we said, the problems aren't just storage. And so it's not enough just to have fast flash. That obviously removes one element. But more importantly, in our opinion, is you absolutely have to have predictive analytics that look at all of the data all the way up the stack, up to the virtual machines, to really understand what's going on and really to inform those people in the data center, our customers, as to where their issues are that might be impacting their business. And it's that combined that we call the predictive flash platform, and it's that that closes that app data gap. So I, you know, you can sort of read the title there, but I actually saw something the other day that said that there's, on your, cell, on your cell phones, every day we send 25 billion text messages via cell phones. Now I remember back in college, in, our, in my final year, we had to take um, technical writing class uh, you know, to write our thesis with. And I remember one day, we were, a couple of us were really bored in that class, so we decided to figure out how long would it take to count to a million? verbally count out to a million? And the answer was days and days and days and days to get there. So if you think about 25 billion text messages, you would have to count to a million 25,000 times. You cannot do that in your lifetime. 
turns out that in sort of the 45 minutes or so that we've been talking, that's how many data points, 25 billion, we've collected from our install base while we've been sitting here. So when you get all of that data, you know, you're actually, obviously, we're very empowered having all of that information. And what do we do with it? There's three main categories that all of that uh, analytics that we do fall into. Really, it's about being very proactively informing and guiding our customers. So we have the InfoSight portal, and you'll see more of that in this presentation later today. But that's where the customer can really go in and get a view, not of raw data. You can't look at 25 billion things or whatever happens to be in your data set. We analyze that and present you with meaningful information that matters to you and your app data gap and how we're closing that or how we're monitoring, detecting, and hopefully predicting and avoiding it altogether. That's the first one. Second is planning future needs, so predicting your capacity trends in advance so you have plenty of time to go address it before you need it. Predicting your performance, how much headroom do I have? Do I need to do an upgrade in order to handle the applications that you're adding into the array or into your environment um, and maintain that sub-millisecond performance without having that app data gap? And again, predicting that so you have plenty of time for planning and getting ahead of it before it becomes any sort of an issue in your environment. And then finally, and this is kind of a, uh, you know, what I always refer to as kind of this unintended consequence of us having InfoSight and being able to do this for our customers. The fact of the matter is, is that because we are doing all of the predictive analytics and automated case creation and trying to avoid customers for our, or uh, avoid problems for our customers, we don't have any tiering in our support organization. So it's literally level one and level two has been elim eliminated. When you call in to support, and you, whenever you do need that, you're talking to a level three support engineer. From the start of that problem to finish, it's that person handling that. There's no handoff to an escalations engineer or to the next level up. The net result of all of this is, as Gavin had mentioned, mentioned almost <laughs> six nines of availability across the entire install base. Nine out of 10 issues are detected by us before the customer is aware of it. So we have that opportunity to be very proactive and predictive and avoid those things that may be going on or potentially going on in that environment. And then finally, 54% of everything that's going on is not storage related and we know about it still. So just a couple of um, quick example of some of the analytics at work. So, I'm going to step through three or four quick scenarios. This first one is an issue that we had where a, we saw a customer had about 10x performance impact in their environment. So this is where maybe they were you know, really used to one millisecond latency. They're now getting 10 milliseconds of latency on an application. So it turned out that there was a problem when we, when we looked into this that the ESX initiator was incorrectly responding to an iSCSI command that we were sending back. And it was a command where we were telling it to throttle back a bit. And the net effect of that was ESX was co coalescing more and more writes every time we told it to hold off you know, in the iSCSI protocol, and it would actually send us more data instead of holding off. So it was this snowballing effect that ultimately it decreased the performance or in increased the latency on that system. So what we did was the data scientists took this information and did a study across our install base right away to understand all of the systems, and there's thousands and thousands of them out there in the world, that might be affected by this same problem based on their workload profiles and what versions of ESX they were running and what versions of Nimble OS they were running. It turned out there were 600 systems out there in the world that could have been impacted by this same performance problem. We actually blacklisted those systems from actually upgrading to our release that was going to cause ESX to expose its issue so that they didn't run into this problem. The net effect of that was essentially two petabytes of data that was on those 600 systems being delivered at that one millisecond latency versus the impacted 10 milliseconds. The next one we had, um, 
sorry, we had a uh, customer that had um, very sporadic, strange latency issues going on. And we, you know, so they had called in. We could actually see through InfoSight's correlation analysis that on a particular host, we were seeing the issue, and that impacted certain virtual machines and certain volumes connected to those virtual machines um, that were running through actually a very particular network path. So we could actually determine that. We could actually see the correlation within InfoSight of a network issue actually causing a performance uh, problem. So we break down <coughs> latencies within InfoSight correlation to understand where latencies are coming from. They may be coming from the host, the virtual machine, uh, they may be coming from the network, or they may be coming from storage itself. In this case, we could see it was coming from the network. And we actually recommended that it was a problem with the NIC. They actually did replace that NIC on the host. The problem went away. This was after that same customer had been working with their, store, or their uh, server side and hypervisor uh, vendor to try and resolve the issue. And they couldn't get to the bottom of what was going on. When they called into Nimble support, we were able to do this right away for them using InfoSight. Uh, second to last one here on the sort of the quick scenarios I wanted to walk through. So this one, uh, you guys are all uh, probably aware that there's kind of two classes at a broad level, two classes of uh, IP addresses, ones that are publicly routable and ones that are private. When you install a Nimble array, we're hoping you're using private IP addresses. There's no real reason to use publicly routable ones. Uh, in, the, in the general case. But some customers actually do that. They configure the Nimble array with publicly routable IP address ranges. When that happens, if you're not protected by a firewall, you have the opportunity to be maliciously attacked over the internet because people can actually route to the ports on the Nimble array in that case. So we, wa we check for this every night. We actually look at every array that is configured in this manner and we use some ethical hacking techniques to first of all understand that it really, really is a nimble array at that IP address on the internet and whether data is exposed in any way. And, and by data being exposed, I mean any protocol that we support, so either iSCSI or SSH or any of the internal protocols we use for replication, for example, we check all of that. If any of them are open to hacking, we actually notify the customer with a P1 case and get that shut down on their firewall or get the IP addresses changed on the array so that they're not susceptible. So we actually found 100 customers that were in fact susceptible to brute force attack in this manner. We closed all of them down. I mean, they did, I mean, working with us. So they're all protected now. We continue to run this every single night uh, to make sure nobody steps back into this problem. Finally, and I think this is this is one of the big things we do that helps drive our high availability of the product. And again, it's five nines and a seven across the install base. But the basic tenant is, is very simple. If we know about an issue, it didn't happen to you. We might have found out about it by one customer that hit it. We might have found out about it by QA after the product was released or maybe something that we found in the support lab. But the bottom line is if we know about it, we need to do everything we possibly can to not let it happen to somebody else out there. So we have this ability to define dynamic update paths. So literally every array, we can control what versions of Nimble OS they are allowed to update to. So when you're on the Nimble OS um, or the arrays management uh, uh, port, portal, uh, it's basically two button clicks to update to a software release. It's, uh, you'll get a list of the ones you're allowed to upgrade to. You click download, then update. So we can control what they're allowed to see. So for example, if you're running 2.1 and we know that you might be susceptible to that ESX issue on 2.2, you won't see 2.2. You'll say 2.3 that has the fix. So you'll never even step into the issue. But so there are literally- sorry, But do you communicate to the end user that uh, he has that problem? So you have a newer version and he, he can't upgrade. Yeah. So he, he, he doesn't see it on the list, but actually the the, the version is available. The, ver the version may be available in the, in the sort of in the real world out there. He won't see it, so he may be aware of it. Within InfoSight, you can see what you're what you're being blacklisted from and what you're allowed to update to. Okay. So you can see the whole um, chain of what you can progress through. So that one would be in red, for example. Yep. Okay. So there's thousands of arrays at any given point in time that have these optimized optimized update paths specific to that customer. If basically the philosophy here is, if you see it, click it. It's safe. Go ahead, do it. It's a two-button upgrade process. 53% of our 
customers update during their prime time business hours, Monday to Friday. What's, uh, what's the uh, install base as far as the current release? How, how much of the install base is running the current release? When was the current release released? Yeah, so uh, you know, the, we, you know, 3.x is the current release for the AFAs, so that's, that's not yet very popular, so that's kind of you know, meaningless in the context of your question. So 2.3 is really the, the big GA release, and that's about 60 odd percent of the customer base is running that latest GA release. And how old is it? Um, yeah, I don't know, maybe eight months or something like that. And that's the hybrid release? Yeah, yeah. And 3.0 was built on that, on top of that. I mean, it's the same. And 3.0 came out when? Well, sorry? 3.0 came out uh, beginning of the year. Okay, so the last, you know, one of the other points I'd made is about this level three support model. This is just what happens when you have level one and level two. I won't step through everything. You guys can read that and you know this thing. The part that's missing on this, it's not a linear, usually, a linear progression like this. There's usually a few loops in here. So I, and we know that. I mean, we're all, we've all experienced that. We, I actually received an email from a customer uh, several weeks back now where they, had, they, they knew it wasn't a storage issue. Um, but they, they were talking and had a case going with their um, server and networking provider. It was the same vendor uh, for that infrastructure. They had a case open for six weeks for a problem they were having. They sent me the email thread from that six week long case. And it was just like that with a pile of loops in there asking for more logs, try this, send us this, on and on, six weeks. They called us finally and asked if we could help. We solved it that day. It was a down rib firmware on their fiber channel switch and some bad configuration settings on that switch. We just fixed that while we were on the phone. And that's nimble support model. You call us, you get level three, the average hold time is less than a minute. You attribute that because you find nine out of ten problems before they even. Yeah, exactly. Come it's, in. it's several things. That's a big part of it. Having high availability is a big part of it. They don't have to. They're not running into problems. <laughs> and the other thing that I think is just as important, two other things that is just as <clears throat> important is that we arm our support guys with tools that look at all this data and can help them solve, problem, solve problems fast. You know, my, my big audacious goal for the support team is no case should take more than 20 minutes. Right now the average is around 45 on, on, you know, for solving a case end to end. The, third, the final factor is we get to hire really talented people because of that, because we're looking for level three.